Hey guys, it's Shruti Dure from THB here at Dallas, Texas. And in honor of Happy Pride Month and Happy Belated Mental Health Awareness Month, we had the amazing opportunity to talk to Dr. Andrea Kim for our June issue. Dr. Kim is a board certified psychiatrist practicing here in Dallas, Texas. Dr. Kim will be answering some of our questions today, so let's get to it. Uh, hi, Dr. Kim. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, I'm just going to hop straight into the questions. And uh, thank you so much again for being here with us. So uh, I think I'm going to start off with the question that we all have. Um, it's a very basic question, but what does mental health or mental illness mean? Yeah, so it's a big word. It's a scary word. People think that it can be a lot of um, extreme cases, but really when we define mental illness, we are just thinking of thought, emotion, or behavior problems that cause dysfunction in a clinically significant way. Um, and that can be because of biological problems or developmental problems when you were born or as a child or psychological problems, how you're thinking about things. So it's a really broad definition and it includes um, things much more than what we think of when we think of mentally ill people. Um, it's so we think of your thoughts, your feelings, and your behaviors that are dysfunctional and cause problems. And then it, it needs to be severe enough to be impacting your work, school, or relationship. So there has to be some sort of consequence or, or issues that are coming up because of it. That's okay. all it is. Okay, so you, those consequences can be scaled depending on the person, correct? So it, Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So for a student, it might be... Um, something to do with school, um, dropping grades or what, whatever, so, so not wanting to go to school. Um, for workers, it would be a work-life thing. For stay-at-home moms, it would be a stay-at-home thing. So it was just where there's impairment in what you know you ought to be able to be doing and achieving and you can't. Okay, okay. So it's like basic life functions are starting to be impeded and that's when you might. Okay. Right. Yeah. Awesome. So I'm gonna to try to switch that up when we're talking about basic life functions. A lot of us due to COVID have been hindered to do our normal things, go out, go get groceries, stuff like that. And how do you think like COVID in general has affected like occurrences of mental illnesses or so? Yeah, so there's been already a lot of studies. I think people were quick to jump on the research because this was um, a universal experience almost. It's kind of a shared global experience of life and routines and things we knew to do for ourselves uniquely coming to a screeching halt. And so when um, there's already been some data rolling in, um, you know, in, in June, 2020, there's there was a study showing that there was an increase in depression and anxiety and substance abuse and suicidal thinking. Um, and this was actually bigger in certain groups like young adults who are very isolated um, communities of color, communities of low income, um, people with job insecurity, obviously for a lot of good reasons. So it's basically the bigger the stressor of whatever COVID did to your life, the more at risk you were for depression and anxiety. Um, these studies have continued to reflect in August 2020 and February 2021, the CDC showing that there's still these increased incidents of anxiety and depression. And now they're showing that there is, people can't get the mental health care that they need. So the, everyone's slammed. Mm -hmm. I am I am very, very busy. I've never been busier. Um, and the just because the community's kind of opened up here in Dallas, the calls are still just rolling in. There's just a lot of aftermath. So I think COVID, um, when, you, when, you, when you stress out this, the human, um, enough, then these things can emerge. Whereas we were, a lot of us were doing the things we needed to do to be happy and then we couldn't, so. I, I, touched, I touched on it a little bit. Um, but how do you think COVID has affected mental health awareness? Like you talked about how more people are understanding that they need help and that they're coming to you and other um, uh, healthcare providers to, to look for that need. So how do you think COVID has affected directly like the awareness and people's knowledge about mental health? I think kind of the silver lining of this cloud is that there's been a huge, everyone, there was just so much empathy because everyone 
to some degree suffered mentally. Um, even the resilient ones, no one, this was not a, a walk in the park for anyone. And so um, immediately like some physician Facebook groups that were on were just like setting up free therapy groups for frontline workers. And I mean, just the, I have patients whose employers are now offering free therapy and um, the teletherapy world has exploded. Um, the government, the, the United States government actually relaxed a lot of restrictions that they put on um, doctors who could see who where. For instance, I have a Texas license, so I can only see Texas patients. And that rule as, as an emergency order went away right at the beginning. So I could see anybody prescribed to any state and, um, and it keeps getting renewed actually as, as emergency authorizations. But I think there was this awareness that mental health professionals just had to be able to not have as many um, restrictions because the demand was so huge. So it was a good thing, I think. Yeah. It's weird how like such a catastrophic event allowed for like certain things to really like blossom, which now might help in general, just overall, like with our existence. I don't know how they're going to go back, honestly, how they're going to, uh, you know, I have patients in New York and Seattle now, and it's like, I, what am I going to do when they put back the restrictions? Um, I think they really opened up a new world. And then all of a sudden you realize, you know, what you have to do in an emergency, how much of it do you need to roll back when mm -hmm. it's over? So we'll see. Relationships that you've built and you can't just like, it's a very yeah. intimate relationship. Right, we're not kicking them to the curb. We, I mean, we gotta, I, I just said, we'll deal with that. We'll deal with that when we get there. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we're still talking about COVID a little. So I was just wondering on its own, it's caused like many of us have a lot of additional anxiety with whatever it might have been that we had prior. But why is this the case? Like why specifically has COVID caused anxiety other than the fact that we were scared we were gonna die if we got it or something like that? Like how can we cope with that additional anxiety that we now have? Yeah, and um, I think when COVID hit, you know, we didn't know what we were dealing with. and it was just a few years ago, we were dealing with Ebola, which was super deadly. And, we, you know, we just didn't know um, what was coming and, you know, we we're following what state had it and how many cases. And then um, when it hit Texas, it was, you know, gloom and doom. Um, I think we were seeing a lot of news and we were seeing um, People, you know, it was a legit, it's a legitimate deadly disease. People are dying, people are being hospitalized, people are having long-term symptoms. Um, and then I think the message to shut down and stay home and quit life as we knew it, I think that probably fueled the anxiety because all we had was um, news websites, um, social media, anxiety and hysteria no nobody could speak into it as an expert because nobody was the expert yet so we were it was basically a group think it was well what do you think what do you think and um i think all the anxiety got fueled um and and if you were uh, if you lived alone no one's challenging your thoughts no one's saying okay take it easy let's do something else right so um, we'd all get eye strain from reading on the, the news sites too much. And I think we were kind of our own enemy in our heads um, because it was not, there was no, there's nothing written on it. There's no textbook on it. We had not been trained in med school. You know, you just had to keep watching the data. So I think it was the unknown. Yeah, like every, everything was put on pause except the bad news. Like that was the thing that kept going and it's just, it was just too much for, I think, a lot of us. Absolutely. That's when I, I had to go to telepsychiatry immediately because we they shut down um, clinics. Mm -hmm. And I just said, you, you need to go back to like our parents where they watched the, they read the morning paper and they watched the nightly news and that was it. And then they went to bed and they didn't do anything. They didn't know about the world the whole day. Mm -hmm. um, and that's probably a healthier rhythm than Excessive. what- what we do now, and certainly I would say this before, but the pandemic really, I was like, you gotta, we gotta just shut the laptop and don't go back on until bedtime, so. 
Absolutely. That's when I, I had to go to telepsychiatry immediately because we, they shut down um, clinics. Mm -hmm. And I just said, you, you need to go back to like our parents where they watched the, they read the morning paper and they watched the nightly news and that was it. And then they went to bed and they didn't do anything. They didn't know about the world the whole day. Um, and that's probably a healthier rhythm than Sesame. what, what we do now. And certainly I would say this before, but the pandemic really, I was like, you gotta, we gotta just shut the laptop and don't go back on until that time. So thank you. And again, talking about putting our lives on pause and being pent up and stuff, um, with a lot of us being pent up at home for long durations of time, how do you suggest we can overcome this new social anxiety that we might have developed? Like, I noticed after things opened up again, I was like scared to order <laughs> stuff. Like, I was like, oh, like, hey, and meeting new people was so weird to me. And I was like, I was doing that for 18 years and I paused for like a year and a half. Yeah. And just that one year and a half has affected me so immensely. So how can we like adjust to that? Yeah. And I think it's not, um, I think it's probably everybody going back because A, we're out of practice and B, we don't know the rules. We don't know the rules of being in the public sphere. Do you want me six feet apart? Do you want a mask on me? You know, do you even think I should be at this event? So I think part of that is we need to know what we're comfortable with personally. And I, it's all over the right. I mean, it's all over the place what people are comfortable with, but then, then you, you know, you perceive a confidence regarding that. Now, in terms of social anxiety, um, I would start with very small groups of very trusted friends, probably the friends you kept during the pandemic. Um, a wingman or a buddy is always good. And you do things very slowly. If you're going to meet somebody new, you meet them new one-on-one, -on -one, like not at a big, well, who is giving big, massive parties, but, um, you know, you would, and you would start with something small. You would not start with um, speed dating. <laughs> you would probably just meet a new classmate and just ask him out to coffee. And um, I think that will come back, especially if you didn't struggle with it before, um, then, then I think, and it's time limited, right? So you can also say, hey, do you wanna meet for 30 minutes for coffee? That's, everyone understands this is gonna be 30 minutes. The other person's probably just as rusty as you. Um, and you can, you can just do something very limited. Um, I think for people with social anxiety disorder, I do ask them to get that on the calendar. Mm. I say, on Sunday, you need to have something for Friday. You need to be texting somebody for Friday or Saturday because the day will come and then conveniently everybody's busy. So they're like, oh, everyone's busy. I tried. So I say Sunday night, you need to be texting people and getting something on the calendar. It's something small, like don't, don't go give your presentation at school, you know, as your first thing, <laughs> or go meet the super important professor that you're asking a recommendation from. You wanna just do something really light. Um, and, and, and humor's good. I think just lightening the mood and just saying, oh man, I haven't done this in a while. And they'll probably say, me neither. And I, my jokes are so bad now. And so I think, everyone's, everyone's there. Everyone's at the same place. So. Like putting that extra effort to kind of like put yourself out there, be a little bit uncomfortable because you're probably not the only one. You're absolutely not the only one. Yeah. That's, sure. That's good. Like, I think even before this interview, I was like extra nervous and I was like, I've done these before. What is going <laughs> on? Like, I don't like this. And, and what she said is really right. Like, I think it's just like, I had so much time to think in silence now that I, I can't do that now. I, everything is actually like I'm saying it. So it's just mm -hmm. something that I'm out of practice with, as you said. It'll totally, it's like riding a bike. <laughs> okay. and it's funny though, uh, what goes first? Yeah. Like, and then what is slow to come back? I think that's just been a very interesting um, thing I've noticed. So. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I think I'm going to like switch up the topic a little bit right now. We're going to, I wanted to talk about like, for the younger children who've missed um, most of their like normal elementary education, I guess you could say two years almost um, experience, like they, these past two years, they probably were all online most of the time. I don't know about outside of Texas, but I know in Texas, we try to do the hybrid. Yeah. 
situation, and I'm pretty sure a lot of states like Washington, Oregon, up north are still full on online. How do you think parents can like help them adjust to social interactions? Because I know early stages of life is when we learn how to interact with other kids and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, hopefully by this point, you know, people are meeting outside, people are meeting at the park, at the playground, um, having play dates. Like, I can't imagine. Um, well, I can't imagine if they're really at risk, uh, an at risk family member, or they're really, you know, closing it in. But um, for those, so I think probably for the past year, people have been starting to open up and decide, okay, we can play at a park and, you know, not pass COVID. For those who have really been isolated, um, I think those kids are going to need a little bit of gentle encouragement. Um, I, first of all, I would say, as long as there's a screen, they're not going to really crave much interaction. They'll be fretful and irritable, but they won't really say, I need to meet a friend. I, I haven't seen a friend in a while. They're just gonna be on their iPad. So I think the first thing we can do is limit their screen time because once you take it away and then you're saying we're done, then they're gonna actually wanna do something and they naturally wanna play. So um, you're a big family, lots of siblings. You've been really blessed during COVID and you can, you can play, but for a lot of people, it may be limit the screen time and then create order to the day and just say, hey, just like I told you for social anxiety for an, an adult, it's the same with a kid. Hey, we're gonna play at the park at nine. I'm gonna, I call two moms with friends you, you liked from school, we're gonna meet. I, I really like the playground in the park because there's no pressure. There's not um, a pressure to entertain or to play with toys or to share. It's just, let's just go play at the park. Um, and then they're going to need to learn to share again, and they're going to need to learn to, you know, how to say sorry and how to ask forgiveness. Um, and that can be really awkward. And I, I just, if they're elementary age, they can report back. So you say, hey, if you had awkward moments, or if you had times when you felt like, in as we're going into this play date, if this is going to be, you know, I want you to keep track of where you felt uncomfortable, where you felt that pit in your stomach where you felt your, your shoulders hunch up or where you wanted to go home all of a sudden. Those are good cues that maybe something happened that we can talk about later. And so then the play date happens and they'll, a good, a good open communication, they might come back and say, oh, I got that feeling like I wanted to run away or go home and this is what happened. And then there's always, it's a great opportunity for conversation, um, their thoughts and their feelings. Okay, were you, were you scared that they wouldn't like you? Were they, you know, you go over their feelings and their fears and then you can redirect them and then even role play with them. And then don't let them stay home. We're gonna try again tomorrow with some different friends. And so I think they'll just get used to it um, gradually. They may have trouble um, with school rules this fall. So I think reviewing the school rules and your expectations and that you always wanna find the good before you focus on the bad. So, um, man, you sat, you, you did not, you sat still and you were polite to the teacher for 30 minutes. That's great. That's better than yesterday. I, she said, you talked back to her or you couldn't, you couldn't stop talking to your friend right around that mark. Do you know what happened? Do you know what we could do? Do you, do you know, you know, we expect a certain thing from you. So I think it's just making sure they know that they're loved unconditionally and that you're gonna focus on the positive, but then you're also gonna say, okay, remember, this is the rule. I know you can do it because you did it two years ago. So mm -hmm. some firm loving uh, responses. Like that assessment after these interactions and like trying to say hey, like, this is what happened, this is how it went wrong, but why did it go? Kind of like just thinking back on it instead of just letting things go and pass and hope they naturally just get back into it. Absolutely, I, I'm not a big fan of, um, <laughs> you'll we'll see how what my kids think but I'm a big fan of talking it out um and understanding that there's always a thought behind a feeling and usually the thought can be modified or changed altogether um and so but everyone can identify with the feeling very quickly they know anger they know sadness they know irritability and so it's about going back and talking with mom the therapist um that okay I actually thought this before right before I got mad um and so they can you can just say hey if you get mad today 
at the play date, let me know. Let's, let's talk about it and try to remember the things that were happening. And it's always going to be, well, he did this or she did this. So you have to unpack it a little bit more. Okay. Well, what happened before that? <laughs> what happened before that? So yeah. I think if I apply that to my life, I think I could prevent a lot of my. Absolutely. A lot me of too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Me too. <laughs> so I was thinking, like you said, mom, the therapist. So in my mom, like even my parents, you know, they're always there for you. And and then they say that, and then you, sometimes you tell them something and they react the way, like not the way I would want them to or something like that. So then I like, for that official help, like how do we know if we need a therapist or a psychologist? Like how do we find the right person for us? Yeah, so I think you just, you hit the nail on the head. If you're talking to your most trusted wise counsel mm -hmm. and they're not actually hearing you, understanding you or that their advice is actually maybe not what you needed or not helpful or doesn't go deep enough. Um, I think a therapist is always a great answer. I think probably we should all be in therapy um, and they're trained observers. They notice patterns. They, they understand the psyche and the, you know, how we're thinking. They know very common pitfalls in our culture, in, in our, you know, in our upbringing. Um, so they've been trained in it um, and they, they can speed things along. I think, of course, reading about situations or um, resonating with a protagonist in a novel. I mean, all these things are very helpful or in a movie, um, talking about it with your friends. These are all really helpful maneuvers, but if, it's, if you're still struggling and it's like, that's not actually what I needed to hear, um, I don't really understand. I, that's not changing my outlook or my behavior and I'm doing all the right things, then um, it's, I think it's time for a therapy. Now therapists are very, very busy because of COVID. So I would say, if you're even thinking about a therapist, just call a therapist and get on their wait list. Yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be a few weeks at least, yeah. um, but there's virtual, there's in-person, there's, I mean, there's telepsych, there's teletherapy uh, all over the nation. I mean, you should be able to hook up with somebody quickly there's probably low cost things in the community or government funded or covered by insurance um or covered by the employer like therapy is all out there and i think that's that's the positive of covid for sure and like also i think sooner than later is like a very key thing right now because i feel like a lot of people push it off or they feel like oh it's not gonna help me right now so i don't I don't need it or I don't need to pursue that. Yeah. But I, any help, help is always better than no help, I feel so. Absolutely. And I really think the, the people who did best in COVID were people who started out, already had a therapist, yeah. was okay. already seeing me, was already on medication, um, had processed and processed and knew the things that brought them life and how to, how to adapt it for COVID. Um, those are the people who did great rather than trying to make a new connection with a therapist while they're struggling. It's much better to walk in and say, hey, remember that thing from three years ago? It's starting up again, rather than saying, hi, my name is Andrea and uh, I'm, th I'm this and I, you know, have, I'm married, you know, all this stuff. You don't want to be starting there when you're struggling. So, um, and I, I also agree this a lot of always, you know, what you want to start when something's small, when something's big, it's big. And you have to really, it's, it's a more um, intense treatment. Yeah. yeah. Just like any, any disease process. So. Yeah. It's, it's, that's the mental health is still health. It's still part of your health. So just treat it the same way. Any other medical thing you would treat. And remember there are pathways in the brain. The brain is a, a habit maker. So the, the more something goes, the easier it goes. So, you know, and that could be for psychotic episodes or manic episodes or depressive episodes or panic attacks. The, be the more you have, the more you'll have. So when, when you have one, that's the time to say, whoa, let me, let me think about this. Let me figure out what that situation was. Maybe I talked to a therapist because if you've had 20, then it doesn't take much at all for you to have in the 21st. Whereas yeah. if you have one, your brain is not quite 
fired and wired for that to go off all the time. So yeah, I forget because your brain makes habits, makes the good ones, but also the bad ones. So. Absolutely. Yeah. A classic example is um, maybe someone with a phobia who gets a panic attack. If it keeps not being treated, they can start to have untriggered panic attacks for no reason, for nothing at all. The brain's just really good at going. So, but if they went, had one panic attack and thought, hey, I better talk to somebody about this and learn some techniques to cope, you know, the odds are much better that it's not just so grooved to go again. So. Yeah, yes. that's awesome. So my next question is going to be, is it ever too late for therapy? But I think we, we talked about that, like never too late. <laughs> never too late. And, and the most important thing with a therapist is to find one you connect with. There are a lot of fields of therapy. There's cognitive behavioral therapy, there's psychoanalysis, there's interpersonal therapy. I mean, there's a lot of modalities and the research would say it's actually the connection that you have with your therapist. The trust um, and the, the reliability you guys have with each other is the most predictive factor of success. So you that you won't know that until you try. So I would go by, I, I, I like recommendations. Um, if someone raves about their therapist, they're probably good therapists. It doesn't mean that you you may rave about that therapist, but you may not, because it's, it's always a, a it's the connection, um, which is going to be based on the client's past experiences and the therapist's past experiences. So it's, um, but I you know I think going by recommendations, um, certainly if finance is an issue, you need to stay somebody that's covered, that's going to be low cost, right? But don't don't despair or give up just because the first one wasn't a good fit. I think yeah, that's I didn't realize it's kind of like any other relationship in your life. Like you want you're not going to be friends with the first person you see. You find out like you wait till you match with someone. Meet, like you know like you have to find similarities or find something you can connect with. Like I'm not going to walk out and become friends with the first person that. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I didn't realize like I didn't think that oh maybe. One, the therapist I have right now isn't the best therapist or something like that. Like I, I think it's like a doctor. Like you have one doctor, you you know that's just who's your doctor for the next twenty years or something. Yeah, it doesn't have to be. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Uh, like finally, I just want to like try to see if we didn't touch on anything. But just before we end, do you think you could give any tips, general tips that everyone and anyone could use to care for their mental health a little bit on their own? Yeah. I think a lot will be things that people know to do. It's, um, so you wanna think about the mind, body, um, mind, brain, body, soul connection, right? So we're all whole people. Um, I think that things that are totally under our control is with clinical benefit would be exercise. I'm a big proponent of exercise. Obviously we all know it has, but has a lot of benefits but it has a lot of antidepressant benefits. It needs to be cardio. So yoga is wonderful for anxiety, weightlifting is great, but the antidepressant effect they found in mice and humans was um, cardio exercise. So they would say that the minimum would be three days, 30 minutes a week, not too much. And then they studied up to five days, 45 minutes a session and it kept getting better. And then they just stopped studying it. So there, but even three days, 30 minutes, separated from placebo as powerful as an, as an SSRI for my mild to moderate depression. So it's great to, to do it. And I wouldn't get hung up on three days, 30 minutes. I would say if you're doing nothing and you do something for five minutes, that's a huge win. That is a take that to the bank and sleep well, because um, it will build on itself. You'll gain, gain more strength. Um, I think there's probably a pretty strong gut mind connection. So the stuff you eat um, can cause some inflammation, which can travel back up to the brain and cause a little inflammation in the brain, which is another theory of depression. So um, I just say, try to eat better. Well, I, don't, I, don't go, I don't go too much beyond that, but um, fewer things from a bag or a box, more things from the produce um, and cooking is better. I think that was the one good thing about COVID is we all had to cook a lot. Yeah. Um, and so people sort of rediscovered easy cooking that um, was better than restaurant food or fast food. Um, you want to 
try to enjoy your meal, put down your fork between bites, eat without the screen, actually talk to somebody um, during meals and make it, you know, just that is your time to deliberately pay attention to your, your enjoy, enjoy the food, but also it's a social time too. So um, if you're isolated, you should call or reach somebody every day. Um, and then people who can do what they love and they figured out how to do it during COVID at like an 80%. Like they weren't pumping iron in the gym and they love to lift weights, but they managed to go to the park and do a lot of exercises and do a video. Like they sort of translated what they needed and they figured out how to do it in a COVID friendly way. Um, again, I feel like, especially in Texas, things are opening wide up. So it's not so much of an issue, but if it ever shuts back down um, and we're getting a little used to isolation. So I think that's, we're, you know, kind of getting the wheels going again on what we need to do. Um, and, and no man is an island. I, I, there are introverts who don't need much, but even the introverts needed people in COVID, in, in the pandemic. Um, I think one blessing of the whole pandemic was that when you take everything off your plate for so long, it actually takes thought to put things back in. And so if people are overscheduled, overcommitted in too many, everything, all the kids activities, you can think about, you can think about it when you put it back in. And I think that's just, a, it, the, the, the automatic routine of it is gone. And so I think that's sort of a blessing everyone's been given. Um, and then kind of like a grandma, keep regular bedtimes, try to wake up in the morning um, at a regular time limit your alcohol, um, mm. do not vape, do not smoke weed, nothing harder. Um, you want to, you want to just try to limit the substances in a time when you're really, when you are really working with your brain and your mind, you don't need extra things hitting receptors that make it hard. So, yeah. um, if you are a worrier, um, I like to recommend a worry journal. You just get a journal and you have you know, usually I say one hour and just open it up and you get to write it down. You can write on your laptop and you're allowed to worry your head off. Just worry, worry, worry. When the timer's up, you close it and then you're done. And there's some satisfaction about knowing that you're not going to forget that awesome worry that you had, the most brilliant worry that no, you will going to forget if you don't keep thinking about it. When it's written down, you can close it. And honestly, the next time it's time to worry, you open, you're like, well, <laughs> probably that's not going to happen and you can evaluate your own mind so sometimes scheduled worry times is really helpful to for getting people to sleep so so um those are the main ones i mean every one of those can go much more in depth but you know good old-fashioned good food exercise sleep find a way to do your hobbies talk to somebody every day mm -hmm. it's not too complicated for those who don't really have that predisposition toward mental illness. Mm -hmm. um, if you do and you're doing all these things and you're in therapy and you're still struggling, that's okay. It just means you may need more people in your life helping you, more professionals. Awesome. I'm definitely going to take notes of some of those things because I didn't realize like how I honestly think like eating and exercising. I was like, I used to be such a, such a, gym freak and then once this happened I was like oh I have like an excuse to relax kind yeah. of and then it stopped for so long and then I didn't go back and I still haven't and so I'm like <laughs> and I can notice like myself being like sleepier more like I want to like just take naps all the time it's like kind of groggy and lazy all the time which is yeah like, yeah I think you are like not alone you are not alone <laughs> and I think the gym still gives there's still a little bit of a heebie-jeebie around gyms um but there's plenty to do outside. I know it's now it's super hot in Dallas, but um, you know, it's just really easy for that to go, and it's really hard to put that back. So you're you're not alone. You could um, I do ask you know some people with long stretches of unstructured time. I just say, well, plan the day, put it in there somewhere, and then honor yourself. Like 
you decided at eight in the morning, you were going to work out at three, honor that. Like the eight o'clock, you had a good idea. The three o'clock, you didn't want to do it, but, but, but probably should listen to eight o'clock you, you know? So. Thank you so much. I learned a lot. I'm pretty sure everybody else is going to do and I really appreciate you taking all this time out for us and giving us this info. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for asking me.